keep you too late. We're opening up a new book uh, of the Bible tonight, and it's nice to be able to say we're going to James, the book of James. And um, I believe this book is going to be a blessing to us. Uh, this is going to be a lot of um, basic, uh, just kind of an overview of the book of James uh, to give you a taste of what's coming, uh, to tell you a little bit about who wrote it and uh, who it's to and all of that. And I hope, uh, I hope you'll, you're never bored with uh, factual type preaching. I know it, it all <laughs> has an application at some point. Uh, in our life, but um, we should want to know all about the Bible, study the Bible, study about the Bible. You know, we need to know what the books of the Bible are and how they relate to one another and who the main characters of the Bible are and all of that. I just think it's important. I mean, it's the greatest book that's ever been written. Uh, so please, please, please don't ever get the attitude. I, and I've heard of some people, uh, you know, that, that preaching should only be a certain way, topical or whatever. I think um, verse by verse and expository is a good thing to do sometimes. So we're going to start out with James chapter 1, and we're going to go uh, through the, ch the first chapter. We'll read it, and then uh, we'll actually get into the bulk of the chapter uh, going into next week, but uh, we'll just get a good start here this morning and this evening. James chapter 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like this, a, a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let a, the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also that shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man, when he, uh, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Uh, every good and perfect, or every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let Every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. <clears throat> but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd help me as I preach. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless this whole Bible study, God. Uh, please bring to my mind and heart uh, the things you would have me to emphasize, Lord, as I try to preach what your word says in, in its context without adding to or taking away or, or forcing anything upon it bring applications to my mind that could be helpful to the use of the hearers, uh, Lord. 
And I just do pray that you'd bless this service this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so James chapter 1. Uh, praise God. We, uh, I really enjoyed the book of Hebrews. We, we got a lot out of that. Um, at, the, at the very end of the book of Hebrews, there, you, there is, I'm just going to give you this note here real quick. It'll make sense in a minute. But uh, that final note, uh, it's not inspirational, right? It's not inspired, but it's in the King James Bible. In many of the King James Bible, it says, uh, written to the Hebrews from Italy by Timothy. Now, that book was uh, never addressed in the text to the Hebrews, but it's very evident from uh, all the stuff that's being said that the book is to the Hebrews and, and to Hebrew believers. Now, why am I bringing that up? Um, we don't know exactly who dictated it, and I think it's debatable whether it was Timothy that dictated it, but it's very clear uh, and to me that the book of Hebrews was written primarily for Hebrew believers originally. But it really helps us. It served as a, a vehicle to really help us as, as, as you know, if, if it was written for the Hebrews of the day to read the Bible and to understand, like, hey, we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that's, that is one thing that's really helpful for them. But for us who didn't grow up in the Hebrew home or in the Hebrew lifestyle, that's very helpful as well, isn't it? Because now we're seeing, hey, okay, we're reading about all these customs of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and he's tying it all together for us. And so that's helpful. Now, um, of course, you know, at the time, the, the reason I believe that we've mentioned this before, uh, I think that when he's writing this from Rome, I think it's the Apostle Paul that's writing it from Rome back to the Christians possibly uh, in Jerusalem because they were all right in the middle of everything Jewish. And it was also the place where every year all the people from everywhere would come together uh, several times a year for the, the Passover and the Pentecost and, and other feast days and Sabbath days. Uh, it was the place where the temple was. It was a place where the Jews would look to and travel for all those days. And the temptation was very strong there for them to just go back, just to give in to the persecution and the social pressure to just give in and go back to uh, their old lifestyle. And it makes sense that, that it would be the two, uh, the Jewish Christians at Jerusalem because in Hebrews 13, 24, it says, Salute all them that have the rule over you. Uh, and all the saints, they of Italy salute you. Now, there were other churches that had other um that had multiple leaders, multiple elders, if you will. Um, but, you know, Jerusalem had a lot of elders uh, who were also apostles. And so Peter and James, uh, to name a few. So the book of Hebrews was written uh, by Paul, um, I believe, to the Christians at Jerusalem, I think is pro probably the case. Uh, you know, it could be a more of a general letter. It doesn't really say that. But basically to encourage them to stay in the faith, don't depart from the faith. You just stick with Jesus. He's the best, okay? Christ is better. And it's written from Italy. Uh, you know, so I think it's Paul. He's the one that's in Rome. He's, he was taken there. If you remember reading through the book of Acts there, you'll see that, like, the Jews wanted to grab him. And he's like, oh, nope, they're going to kill me. And he said, I want to I wanna go to Rome. I appeal to Caesar. And they're like, okay, well, we have to take you to Caesar now. And so it saved his life, but he ends up probably dying in Rome. Uh, there's not a record after that. So he could have he could have died of, of old age there. I don't know. Uh, but we have several of his epistles written uh, at the end of his life in Rome. And so um, anyway, we last week we looked at a, at, at a bunch of evidences, and that's not my point tonight. I'm just trying to wrap up a few things and to tie this book into the next book, which, you know, the order of the books isn't necessarily inspired. It's just the canon, the way they put them together. But when you see this, you're going to see, hey, it does make a lot of sense. So you get to James chapter 1, and uh, notice who it's addressed to. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. So the formal title of the book of James is the general epistle of James. So in the New Testament, you'll have books that are addressed to people, right? So you have Timothy and Titus. Uh, you have books that are, uh, you know, that are titled after the person who wrote them. And then you have books that are titled uh, to, uh, to, the, for, to deal with the place that the letter is being sent to or the churches in that region 
that it's being sent to. So this is the general epistle of James. Uh, it's in it's not written to a specific church or churches or anything or any one individual. It's an open letter of sorts, but he gives us a specifically who he really wants to read this. Now, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I believe the book of James absolutely is inspired in his scripture uh, as it was written by James here and inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, without question. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and those, of course, uh, that verse I just quoted is referring to the Old Testament scriptures that were written, but the, the inspiration was still going on. We don't have new books of the Bible being written today. I believe we have a closed uh, canon of scripture. It's done. Uh, this book is one of those. But notice this. Let's talk about, first of all, um, you know, I, I was trying to point out that, that the book of Hebrews was clearly written to, to Hebrews, but this book as well is written to Hebrew people as well. Um, maybe uh, Paul was writing from Italy back to Jerusalem. Uh, James is writing from Jerusalem to all the, 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 the Jewish Christians scattered abroad. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. All right, so let's. who wrote the letter? Let's start with some of the basics and just go through. I won't keep you long tonight, I don't think, and um, it's probably a good thing. I know uh, there's been a lot going on, and there's sickness and things going on, but let's see what we can learn about this. James, the servant, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when I was looking up to see who the author of James is, obviously it's James, but I, I just had to scratch my head here, and uh, there are actually a bunch of people in the New Testament named James. And so which one is it? I don't know. <laughs> which one is it, brother? <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> Do you have it? What's your theory? Do you have any thoughts? <laughs> it's crazy. Right before we came in here, me and my wife were talking about two of the, I was like, there's two of the 12. That's right. James, the son of Alphaeus. That's right. James, uh, one of the sons of thunder. I was like, you know, then I was saying, I know there's a James that's, Jesus' brother. brother that's right. Yep. But I was like, I would lean to being one of them of 12, uh, but I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, all right. Let's talk about it. Amen. So good good thoughts. So you just must have been uh, the Spirit working on this this topic, right? right? Before I walked in, yeah. Outside, so, yeah. So you're like, is Pastor going to cover this tonight? I hope he answers this question, yeah, and the he, first thing I say is, I don't know. Why you said that? I looked at my eyeballs. All right. It's like, I don't know. But we'll, we'll get into it a little bit. Um, there are cases to be made different ways, and uh, I, I don't know for sure, I'll be honest. But there are several people named James in the New Testament. Two of them were apostles, right? So uh, in Matthew 10, it lists the apostles. Um, here are the disciples, the apostles. In Matthew 10, 2, it says, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and, and Matthew, a publican, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Okay. Now, uh, it could have been one of these two guys, and um, and it, it very well may be, right? And uh, there, there's a lot of confusion about this. Um, there's a lot of thoughts about this, but we also know that Jesus had a brother. Well, we would call him a half-brother, right? Um, that was named James. But he also had, it's interesting, isn't it, that he had, in Matthew 13, 55, it says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? So here you've got like three of the disciples uh, named the same as three of, the, uh, of Jesus' brethren. So that's kind of interesting little tidbit. You know, it's like, how did that happen? But okay, that's must have been common names, right? And then, uh, I mean, you know, that, that would happen. That could happen very easily. Um, then it calls, now in Galatians 1.19, to add to this mystery, it says, um, but other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. So James, the Lord's brother, is an apostle. And so I don't have a good, clear answer on that. Um, but we do know that James... The son of Alphaeus is actually a cousin of Jesus, um, uh, son of Mary's sister, I believe it is. <clears throat> so I'm not entirely sure. I, I was going leaning towards, you know, James as the half brother of Jesus, and that basically he's the he became the elder of the church in um, in in Jerusalem. That's what I was leading 
towards being the author. I'm not dogmatic on it though, because uh, I I um I kind of scratched my head on it trying to figure that out. And when when did his brother become a um, an apostle? And you know, or, or could it be that you know it's referring you know that in Galatians chapter one, somebody I, I read behind they said that maybe that the Lord's brother is it was. Um, being used more as like a kinsman, you know, like a, a close kin or whatever, nearest to kin or whatever. And I don't know how that would work. Um, so it could be the, the apostle James, the son of Alphaeus, that he's talking about. Mary and Alphaeus, yeah, or Alphaeus, yeah. Anyway, I don't know. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit more about James. Sorry, I didn't give you a great answer on that one. <laughs> uh, in Acts chapter 12, let me go, let's go to Acts, we'll look at James. Um, we do know that he was the leader. I mean, and this is, if, if it's, this is the one that I believe it is. <laughs> um, the Bible says in Acts 12, verse 16, but Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, of course, you remember the story here. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's got out of jail and uh, through a miracle, and they're having a prayer meeting and all of that. And they saw him, and they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace, declared unto them to, uh, how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. James was an authority. He's mentioned so many times in the book of Acts. Uh, he's looked as one who settles disputes among the believers. If you remember the different councils that were had uh, in Acts 15 and Acts 21, um, there was that law keeping and, and uh, circumcision question um, that the churches of Galatia wanted to, an answer to and Paul basically had withstood some of the Jews to the face he was just you know really given you know just just trying to shut that down and they, the church leader said go uh, see James go see the, the apostles in Jerusalem and get give us a word. And if you remember in Acts, if you turn over to Acts chapter 15, um, James gave the final word in that council and commissioned the uh, people from the church to go to those other churches to spread that word. Hey, this is our final verdict on this situation. So, anyway, and, uh, notice in Acts chapter 15, verse 13, he says, And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Jump down to verse 19. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which uh, from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preached him, preach him being read in synagogues every Sabbath day. Anyway, he was the authoritative figure in Jerusalem, uh, the Jerusalem church and among other churches. So, if my theory is correct, like he's not an apostle, he's just a, a, the leader or pastor there, but I could be completely wrong on that. Um, and uh, we then see Paul travel back to Jerusalem in chapter 21, in 21, eight, uh, 18, it says, And the, the day following, Paul went in, in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. So regardless, just going with who he is, he is a, a very important leader uh, that is looked to and that has authority among the other apostles and elders of the church. Um, and we just don't have just a super lot of detail about how the early church was, the church in Jerusalem was structured and all of that. We have what we have. Uh, so we're just going to have to leave that to, um, you know, to what it is. But anyway, um, we see he's a very important character. He had authority and respect to the apostles, elders, and brethren of the churches. And his, uh, in his introduction to the book, what I think we could get from his introduction as he writes this is I believe we can see his humility. Uh, notice he says um, in his intro in verse 1, um, he doesn't say, you know, hey, I'm James, the brother of Jesus, you know, as if that would get him anything. It's not, you know, he's a half-brother, right? Um, but he, people, you know how people are. They name drop. They, they try to make themselves. And if he wasn't the brother of Jesus, he could have said, I'm James, the great apostle. And not, not that uh, it would be wrong to refer to himself as I'm the apostle. The, the Paul, or the apostle Paul in his letters referred to him as a, himself as an apostle, but he often referred to himself 
as a servant. I, at least three times he referred to him, you know, a servant of Jesus Christ. So the same way, uh, very humble, and a humble, humble way to say it. Um, you know, he didn't he didn't say, uh, you know, or, or to kind of just talk about humility for a second. He didn't walk up and say. Uh, you know, I'm literally the greatest uh, apostle ever. I mean, in the history of the whole you know, apostleships, you know, like a Trump type of thing. Um, you know, and a lot of people think that's funny. It, it is funny when Trump does that kind of stuff, but it's very super prideful. And pride is a root sin that's very wicked, um, and it leads to a lot of wickedness. You find a prideful person that's a wicked person. And uh, we need to be very careful that we, we don't let pride in our life like that. It's easy to get puffed up and arrogant um, and think we're something or above what we ought to think of ourselves. So it was James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James, the servant. Turn to Matthew chapter 20. So at the end of the day, all we are supposed to be, uh, no matter what stature or place we get in life, let's say you climb the ranks of the the social life, you climb the ranks of of, of a business, you climb the ranks uh, in the world of economics, you climb the ranks in a church, you become a pastor or a big pastor, big church pastor, that kind of thing. At the end of the day, no matter if you are the pastor of the church of Jerusalem and you seem to be the leader and everybody's looking to you, even there's even people like Peter and even people like uh, the the other elders and so forth. End of the day, remember uh, Jesus set this example when he told us in Matthew chapter twenty verse twenty five. But Jesus called unto them and said and and said. Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority on, upon them. But it is not uh, shall not be uh, uh, so among you. But whosoever will be the uh, great among you, let him be your minister. And that word minister means a servant, someone who serves someone. And whoso will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You remember what Jesus did to set an example? He literally, he's, he's washing the feet of the, the other men that were following him. He's the, the leader. He's, they're following him. They're, they're, uh, they are his disciples, but he's washing their feet. Peter's like, hey, wash my, well, no, you, you, you can't wash me. You know, and he's, he's like, well, you know, it must be so. And uh, he said, well, then I guess wash everything. He's like, and that would have broke the picture uh, that was given there. I believe the picture is that once you're saved, you're washed completely. But sometimes you get your feet dirty in the world. And sometimes you need your feet washed. But you don't need to be uh, completely washed because uh, your sins have been washed away. Anyway, that's the picture, I believe, that, that of that. But my point is, is that all we're to be at the end of the day, the greatest in the kingdom of God are those who serve, who serve others and serve Jesus. I'm just a servant. I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus. What's a servant's job? Turn over to Matthew chapter 18. Well, a servant's job is simple. It's obedience. It's obedience. He says, you know what? I'm just a servant. And it keeps you in a humble place when you when you say, "Hey, you know what? I'm not the big shot. I'm not the one calling the shots." In First uh, Peter chapter five, the Bible says, "This is First uh, Peter five. Uh, Peter talks about the fact that you are to to lead the flock of God, not as lords, but as an, an example of the believers. So it is not a matter of, uh, you know, he says, "The greatest that are among you, serve." You know, serving God, serving people is should not be below you. That should be something that you're willing to do. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, the Bible says, And it came at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's the greatest? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and sent him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. For whosoever therefore shall humble himself... As this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot to unpack there, but I'm not going to take the time. But you, you see the humility. They're coming and saying, hey, I'm the greatest, you know. 
uh, you know, who I want to be the greatest. Can I be the greatest? You know, who out of us, who's the greatest? You know, it might be me, you know. The Spirit of God is upon me, you know. So uh, that kind of thing. I might be the greatest. But he's saying, you know what? You need to humble yourself as this little child. Uh, and it's the people who humble themselves. Because anybody can brag. Anybody can be, you know, th think of themselves as great and all of that and attain greatness and all of those types of things. But what about serving and humbling yourself? These are the virtues. The Lord flips all this on its head. Turn over to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses uh, or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall uh, inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. This is a big theme in Jesus' teaching is you know to basically put yourself at the last sit yourself at the lower table don't you know don't put yourself up there don't walk and presume and put yourself out there as the greatest you stay humble and that's a virtue uh to do that james is a servant he says you know what i'm the servant of jesus christ i'll always be under him i'm not a big shot what was it what was the sin of lucifer i will be like the most high <clears throat> He, he wanted to, to take the spot of greatness. When we're prideful, we, we're taking the glory from God. Always to God be the glory. All right, so let's talk about this next phrase here. Uh, so we've talked about who wrote the letter. We don't know for sure, but James did. We know James did. <laughs> but uh, which James it was, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but it's written, who's it addressed to? And I think this is interesting. There's been a lot of speculation on this. But the Bible says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. I don't think this is too complicated. Uh, some people believe that this is saying that it's like a spiritualization thing because uh, Christians are the true Jews. They're the true Israel of God. I, you know, I don't think that's necessarily what he's driving at here. Um, I just I don't believe that. That's not really the, the logical interpretation. It doesn't say that the Israel of God or have some way of describing that. And... You know, while we're called the Israel of God, there's no real place where it talks about, you know, Christians being from specific tribes or whatever. So I don't think that's what it is. Uh, you know, I think that would be more of a symbolic uh, interpretation that would be over with um, maybe your amillennial crowd, something they would say. Um, but but what what is this talking about? Well, we think about the book of Hebrews. And it doesn't say that it's written to the Hebrews, but it, this book here directly addresses the 12 tribes scattered all over the place. So it's written to the saved people who are born again, okay? It's not particularly, uh, you know, when people try to read this as a salvation pamphlet, like you would read the book of John as, as a, you know, a gospel pamphlet, a, a, a tract, if you will, on how to be saved, you're going to come up with some mixed up doctrine. And so it's not a book to the lost on how to be saved, unlike what some people think. Um, <clears throat> they end up over in Lordship Salvation and uh, Paul Washer, Ray Comfort, John MacArthur land, which is heresy. It's wicked. It's a, it's a damnable heresy what they teach. Uh, but this book is written to the saved, to the born again. Uh, as you'll find uh, him speaking in verse 2, he says, My brethren, and I don't think he's saying uh, here... Um, this is a double-fold brethren. He's saying to the brethren that are saved, maybe he's talking about his Hebrew brethren, but he's saying brethren. I think he's saying my saved brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what he's saying, okay? Now, who are these people who are 12, uh, the, you know, the 12 tribes scattered abroad? And again, let me just also point this out. These, uh, I believe the, the purpose of this book is he's teaching them how to deal with persecution and trials, at least in the first chapter. But the word scattered abroad there, it was interesting. I looked it up, and I don't, I, I'm sure I'm pronouncing this wrong. I don't speak Greek, okay, but, you know, the word is diaspora. And I immediately, that's the, you know, how they write it out um, there, uh, the phonetic spelling, if you will, or whatever. But the word diaspora is a word you might have heard before uh, because the Jews talk about it. Um, they talk about the diaspora because, um, you know, typically in relation to the scatter, the word diaspora means scattering abroad. And uh, as we see the King James, but 
basically when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, um, Jews were just basically running for their lives every which way. And they were actually banned from Jerusalem and areas of Judea. And so that was called the diaspora. Well, where did they go? Everywhere. I mean, they were going down into, you, you know, Israel uh, is a land bridge between three continents, Africa, um, you know, uh, Asia, and uh, Europe. And so um, they're just going everywhere. There, there are Jewish people that migrated all over the place uh, from that, that point. Um, but that wasn't the first scattering or diaspora. In 721 BC, Assyria swept in and captured the northern uh, kingdom, the ten tribes, if you remember that. And this was a judgment of God upon them. And it was a horrible thing. I mean, they, they were just so wicked. They had, they had just they had set up uh, all kinds of, they set up devil worship and all of this. And God finally got tired of it. As you read through the Old Testament, you'll, you'll know all about the story. But in 721 BC, which is 721 years before Christ, it counts down there uh, to Christ uh, in the calendar before Christ, uh, they were carried captive and assimilated into the kingdom. Some were left uh, in that Judea, uh, that that northern tribe area, the, the the Judea area, and other people were brought in, but they were assimilated into the larger Assyrian kingdom, and they were assimilated in, and there was never a big return from the northern ten tribes back. So that's your first diaspora. They were scattered to the the Assyrian Empire, and then in 586 uh, B.C., the southern tribes were taken captive into Babylon. Now. This is the one we know more about, or we, we think more about. You know, we've got Daniel and these different characters, uh, because there was the return, and you know, a, a large portion um, of them were able to come back at one at one time. First to rebuild the temple, then to rebuild the walls, and all of that. And it all started about seventy years later. Uh, they were able to return. Not everyone returned after these these scatterings, though, um, and so. Uh, this was God's judgment upon them. They were scattered. I mean, these people, you read the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God, you know, the, the Babylonian uh, king, Nebuchadnezzar, came in, took them out of their home. He's taken and relocating all these people, relocates Daniel to uh, his capital city and all of that. And uh, so many people never returned. Um, when you think about this, too, uh, the, the Babylonian kingdom fell during that 70 years and um, the, the Persians came in and then that kingdom eventually fell and so forth. So people are migrating, moving around. There's all kinds of things going on. And many Jews just never, Hebrews never came back. So uh, turn to Acts chapter 2. So who is James addressing here? Now, um, I believe he's just, it's real simple. He's addressing the saved, born-again people who are descendants of, of the 12 tribes. People who, you know, are, were the Jewish, Jewish believers who converted from, uh, from, you know, the faith of the Jews to Jesus Christ. And they are now, that they're, they're scattered all over the world. Um, now, you remember the day of Pentecost... Uh, one of the very important holy days of, of the Hebrews, how God gave the members of the church of Jerusalem the gift of tongues. And he caused them to be able to speak and communicate with the um, people coming in uh, in their native tongue. They're coming in from all other parts of the world, from near and ver from very far away, to celebrate uh, this feast of the Pentecost. And they were able to speak, the disciples, the, 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 ch the uh, families, the, the church family went out soul winning on a big massive soul winning push on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And they were able to speak to people and get them saved. And God gave them a miraculous gift to be able to speak to people in their native tongue. In Acts chapter 2 verse 7, the Bible says, And they were all amazed and marveled saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? He's like, wait a minute. These are people from right here in Galilee, the area around the, the, the Sea of Galilee, this Judean area here. 
And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So now you've got, what does this mean? This, this, these people were born. Now, th why are these people here? They're here because they're Jews and they're traveling back from their, these, uh, traveling to, from there, uh, from their home. And he's going to list a bunch of places. And they've been born. So these are, these are people who are possibly multi-generational Jews that possibly left and moved away from the scattering, the diaspora, if you will. So they're born in other countries. They're Jews that were born in other countries. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia. And Parthian, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, which is Asia Minor. Um, it's talking about Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in other parts of Libya, Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, <laughs> Jews and proselytes. If you looked, if you were looking at a map, you'd see all these places. These are far places away. This is a long way away. Cretes and uh, Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So you think about this this period of time. You got Jews coming back from all over the place to Jerusalem on these massive feast days, and what are they doing? Uh, the, the the disciples are able to speak to them in their own language. So that's these are the very people I believe that this book is ref, uh, is referenced to. It's addressing these people from the 12 tribes scattered abroad. The book of Hebrews is for them as well, I'm sure. But there were a ton of Jews who were born outside of Galilee in other places with other languages, and many of them converted to Christianity. So it makes sense for James to write a letter and to address them since he was probably addressing the Jews in Jerusalem much more frequently. So he's like, he's sitting in Jerusalem, most likely sitting in Jerusalem, and he says, okay, we've got all these other Jews that are coming to Jerusalem every year or whatever, several times a year. Let's give them some material. Let's send a letter out for them to disseminate to all the Jews in the synagogues, uh, uh, you know, these Christians that are meeting in churches all over the place. Um, these Christians that are meeting in churches, he, he says, let me write a letter to them. So from Jerusalem, he says, hey, I want to write a letter to help the, all the, the Christians who are of the Hebrew descent uh, to know how to live and be a good Christian. So here, send this out. And, you know, possibly, I don't know, I'm just speculating here, completely speculating. You know, maybe he was disseminating that out when there was these special days that would come as they get people saved and so forth, as people would get saved. 3,000 people on, in Acts 2 got saved in one day. And so... Um, you know, anyway, I, I just thought I would, I wanted to take a little time to explain that. All right, let me just give you a, a few key facts about this and we'll be done. Uh, the purpose of the book is um, really to teach Christians uh, the right Christian behavior uh, for these Hebrews, these believing Hebrews, these saved Christians, right? And really, I think number two, you could say the purpose would be to teach the principle that faith should be demonstrated by good works. Like Christians should live their faith out, right? Work out their own salvation. Two of the key verses of the book are in James chapter 1, verse 22. Uh, the Bible says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Wow, is that a powerful verse? We'll talk more about that when we get to it. But um, there are many people who sit and listen to the word of God, but they don't allow it to effectually change them. But they, they check a spiritual box by attending church. They check a spiritual box by listening to the preaching. But it's not actually changing them. them. They're not doing what they're learning, and they're deceiving them, their own selves. In James chapter 2, verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So that's another key verse of Scripture that goes along with this particular book. And I, I think we'll, we'll go into a deep dive on that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> main words of the book, you find 16 times the word faith, and 16 times you find, 13 times you find works, and th three times you find work. 
And I would say James is, you know, the Proverbs of the New Testament. You'll have a lot of similarities there. And I think also I, I like to think about James. It is it, similar to the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. James uh, emphasizes justification before man. And, of course, you know, people get very confused in James chapter 2. We'll go into deep, deep detail on that and explain this. But they'll read about, you know, man being justified by works. And, I mean, I've talked with people at length about this, and they always seem to just get so hung up on this and confused. I had a guy tell me, I went to Bible college with, and he's like, well, pastor, you know, how do you, how do you put Romans and James together? I mean, you know, there's got to be a balance of both. You've got to have some faith and some works in order to get into heaven. Yeah, it's faith alone, but you've got to have some works. And I'm like, that's, you got it wrong. <laughs> no, that's not it. So James is emphasizing uh, to a saved congregation, to, uh, to these believers, um, that they should be justified. It's emphasizing justification before man. Uh, and it's, it's explaining that people like Abraham showed they lived out their faith. If Abraham had just believed on the Lord, called on his name, and had faith in Jesus Christ, we wouldn't be reading about him today. Uh, but the fact was is that he lived by faith, and he, he uh, did many things by faith. Uh, over and over again, uh, the Bible records the things he did by faith. And it was those acts of faith after salvation that really make him stand apart. And it's those acts of faith after salvation that's going to make you stand apart. And it's going to be the, what makes you stand apart. It's because it's everything that is done uh, in the spiritual realm has to be done with faith. Faith is that key that, 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 that unlocks the, the things of God, that allows you, uh, God, if we come to with faith, uh, we're able to move mountains, we're able to do great things. He gives us power uh, and so forth and boldness and, and strength and all of those things. But we have to have faith. We come uh, to him with faith, with prayer requests and provision and all of that. Paul emphasizes justification before God in Romans and tells us flat out that, you know, before uh, the Bible says, um, you know, in Romans 4, 2, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. The emphasis of Romans is dealing with salvation, dealing with how to have your soul saved from hell. Uh, but James is speaking to a saved crowd and saying, hey, you know, why don't you have some, why don't, why don't you do some profitable works? Why don't you just take your, uh, all the stuff that you've heard and become a doer of the word? So that's the emphasis. And then lastly, uh, the epistle of James is a very practical book. Lots of little, um, hey, don't do this in the church. Don't, you shouldn't do this. You should do this and that kind of thing. And the beginning of the book basically uh, deals with a preparation. I, this book was written before um, the major persecution and, and, and some of the other things began as, uh, you know, <clears throat> people of Hebrew descent were, were in trouble with uh, the Roman Empire and all of that. And there is a testing of faith uh, the Bible talks about. And how he deals with uh, other things as well, uh, such as partiality in the church showing favoritism or or treating people differently based on monetary or, or you know net worth things like that he warns about the tongue wow we have some things i'm doing a series kind of preempting myself here i guess doing a series on the power of the tongue you'll come have to come back on sunday to hear that he deals with worldliness he deals with uh, the danger of of being you know very wealthy he deals with uh you know preparations for the lord's eventual return and he deals with prayer uh healing and prayer and so to, to do a quick overview the first chapter of the epistle deals with the purpose of the trials in the christian life that's what we're going to be dealing with next week uh in the temptation to do evil um and how we're we're never tempted to to sin by god that's a great point to make to the Calvinists. Um, we're going to be dealing with the exhortation to do the word and not just hear it, to, to really strive and attain, to, to, to change and to 
have our lives transformed by the hearing and preaching of the Word of God. And then we'll have uh, this idea laid out for us, what true religion and undefiled is, and how we need to be have the right kind of religion. Not be religious, where people walk around like the Pharisees, uh, being either judgmental or doing things just to be seen of men. But we actually care about people and try to meet their physical needs. All right, just a quick introduction to the book of James. Next week we'll get into uh, the verse by verse uh, really strong. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you bless us as we go. We love you so much. I thank you, God, for all that you do. Um, please just bless this study. Bless our we, God, uh, all that we have going on in the church, the church family, I should say. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.